This is Podkit, episode 24. If you do do that, don't. On Saturday, August 27th, 2016, and now it picks one. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk24. Hey, Hello. Everybody. Welcome to this is us. us again. It's been yes. only a short while this time. How many months has it been this time? Uh, I think it was June... June 11th was the last one, was episode 23. Oof. Well, right, well, it's not quite two months. <laughs> pretty, pretty close. But it's good we're back. But it must mean we have loads to talk about for the, every week for the next two months, right? Uh, I don't know if that's Indeed. how Indeed. this kind of show works anymore. <laughs> we just talk about something occasionally. <laughs> Hopefully it won't be two months again, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, it probably won't yeah. be that long. I apologize. I was in Bemidji for a month working at recorded language villages so that was uh, a big reason why at least the first month we didn't record right that's okay though and, I'm, and i managed to somehow move twice <laughs> yeah i don't know how you did that uh yeah it's a good question it's a good question yeah so those those things i think were big contributors to why we haven't recorded in so long but we're all alive and we're all here now so fortunately yes so the first thing on our list here is a short little thing about Apple, which is a pretty common occurrence these days. Um, so Apple was at Black Hat this last weekend, and they announced that they're doing security bounties. So uh, they're joining a list of many big companies, uh, most of which have had bug bounties for a while. Um, so uh, basically, Apple will reward security researchers who share critical issues with Apple. Um, and they make it a priority to resolve those issues as quickly as possible, and they will provide public recognition or not if asked otherwise. And so they have five categories. So secure boot firmware components, 200,000. So I think this is iBoot. This is the lower level, uh, possibly even hardware exploitable, so, or firmware that is on the ROM for booting up the phones, or I guess any of their computers. Um, so this generally needs a hardware refresh to fix so it's a lot. And then extraction of conf- confidential material protected by the secure enclave processor. So this is the processor that manages things like Touch ID in the iPhone 5S and newer. They do a lot of their own um, secure things. I don't know, it's, like a, it's a separate SOC on the device. Uh-huh. And then execution of arbitrary code with kernel privileges. So that's not good, escaping your process. And then unauthorized access to iCloud account data on Apple servers. So I think this is the first time I've seen Apple, I guess, acknowledge that they have lots of information servers. Because you don't just hear about iCloud. You don't. I feel like you don't generally hear about Apple servers, or it's just you know the ominous cloud. Your data is mm-hmm. just there. I don't know, thought that was a little interesting. And then access from a sandbox process to use your data outside of that sandbox. So these are kind of the jet, the main components that they have in their um, offerings. And they have uh, also, they have a clause. So if the researcher chooses to donate it to a charity of their choice, Apple will match one-to-one. I think that's a nice way of also um, making it for a good cause. Yeah, for sure. Now this will start off with um, a smaller group of researchers. They only invited a few dozen initially, but I think they will open it up the future to more and as more people find new bugs they can um, go to apple and ask um if they're yeah well they say if vulnerabilities that would be covered under the program are submitted by researchers outside of the program we will review the submission and if the work merits it invite researcher uh into the program and reward the vulnerability so that's awesome yeah i think that's a good opening of apple and they had uh, for the first time a talk on security at a conference, as far as I know. Um, And so they uh, mentioned a lot of the things that uh, I think many people knew how it worked, but this is more in an official, this is how documenting it kind of way. It's interesting. A lot of the security researchers I follow on Twitter seem very interested, so yeah. 
I, I was yeah, reading sure. about the um, user key bags. So there's different classes of keys and bags. It's pretty neat. Yeah, and they go through the entire process of um, unlocking the phone, uh, or sorry, booting booting up a phone, unlocking it, locking it, unlocking it with Touch ID. So, and then the process for doing a update later over the air for more update. So the most common occurrences of, I guess, doing a master lock and unlock on the device. Yeah, indeed. Super cool, super cool. And we'd be remiss, remiss if we did not mention also that um, uh, DEF CON is going on at the moment, uh, which is another kind of large security conference uh, over over to the West along with Black Hat. So. Uh, a bunch of people I know that I follow on Twitter are also present at that sort of thing. So you'll probably hear a non-zero uh, amount of buzz surrounding that right now. Um, yeah, did I mention to you guys uh, Tony Webster, somebody who I think is, uh, if not, if I haven't mentioned him uh, fewer than, if it, I know I've mentioned him at least once, possibly more times. Um, as uh, on, on the Twitter follows list, uh, he is a quite cool person who uh, goes to DEF CON every year. I think he went this year as well. Uh, and particularly, uh, he mentioned that this year was particularly interesting uh, as far as vulnerabilities that came out on, uh, or proof of concept sort of things that were demonstrated on multiple platforms. And I think at one point he had a tweet that was something along the lines of um, like, this talk will make me a Linux laptop person, even though I don't want to be a Linux laptop person. And that now I'm trying to find that, even though I can't find it, um, because that was pretty, pretty high quality tweet. <laughs> I know the other talk I heard about were uh, Charlie Miller and Chris uh, Vlasic presented one more talk, their final talk on um, car hacking. So I think they used their Jeep Cherokee and uh, demonstrated the ability to break and more control the car from a device rather right, than indeed, remote indeed. execution. Yes, I and of course, a ton of us about that one. And I, I think uh, who I don't know if it was Jeep or another um, organization representing car industry sent a message out basically saying this is this is nothing. They already they did they demonstrated remote. Con connectivity and this is just a further basing on that and i think that maybe even used an older version of the firmware on the car i'm not sure uh -huh. but nonetheless it's pretty uh pretty remarkable that they were able to identify it there yeah very impressive all right so who has thoughts about react native i do i do so i've been using react native uh for the past couple of months now uh in a really interesting um, for a really interesting project that I can't talk to you uh, in, in too great of depth about, um, but it's been really interesting to work with the framework and see how it's evolved even over these past couple of months. Um, as you guys know, it's kind of notorious. All the entire React ecosystem is pretty notorious for breaking changes uh, and not really obeying by Semver. <laughs> um, version fourteen, <laughs> version fifteen, version sixteen. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, moving minor versions up to major major versions and patches up to minor versions. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah. Because well, you know, I mean, they're pulling a Google Chrome and Firefox. No, it's not the same. It, yeah, yeah. It's, it's worse. It's definitely, it's definitely worse. I would agree. But it's been really interesting to work with that tooling, to work with Redux and Redux Sagas, uh, which is a really interesting way of like handling uh, like events yep. in, in a way that's, that's really... Um, like immutable in a way that I find like really beneficial for debugging. In fact, like I saw, I, we resolved an issue today that was so um, made so much easier by that, uh, by, by the fact that we had a mutable and traceable state that we could go back from the beginning and compare the output of two different requests and see how it turned out. It was quite, quite cool. I was quite a fan. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that I've ran into with React Native in particular is that it's very difficult to get um, parity across iOS and Android builds, I feel. You can get like general parity, right? Like you can definitely run the same source JavaScript on both machines or on, on both in both environments. Mm -hmm. But as far as building the app goes, you sincerely have to set up two 
different apps. You have to set up an iOS app and you have to set up an Android app project. Yeah. Both, both of those indeed uh, in order to fully test it. And, and even then um, it's very difficult. One, one kind of interesting thing I found about the Android emulator is that it doesn't actually run on computers that have VirtualBox or Docker or the Docker daemon running, uh, which is uh, unfortunate for me as I generally have both running. <laughs> but um, uh, so if, if you if you do do that, don't uh, because you'll you'll sit there and wonder what what you did like I did for for much too long. Um, but once that once that's out of the way, um, it's all it's all pretty slick. Slick, and the Android emulator is relatively reasonably fast on an, uh, on a Mac of of uh, relatively recent origin. But nonetheless, it's still um, it's still not my favorite thing. Like the the iOS emulator, I feel is much more polished, um, much more responsive, and a, also a much more accurate um, representation of what you'll see on on the final product. I feel than the Android emulator. But what can I say? I also own an iOS device, so maybe maybe I should be. And I'm and I'm talking right now on an Apple inclined podcast, so perhaps my words <laughs> should be taken with a grain of salt. I, I have also heard that over the years the Android development experience has gotten a lot better. Oh, it has. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So I think it's still really bad though. <laughs> yeah. How recent was it that they they used in IntelliJ for App Android Studio? That a couple, a couple years, years. ago. Two years, something. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so been two to three years. So two years ago, they switched from forcing everybody to use Eclipse to building their own branded version uh, into Android Studio, which is really super nice, and everybody appreciates it. However, there's still a lot of work to be done uh, with regards to the emulator, but also just just the um, developer tools in general aren't as um, pristine. Uh, you could say as for example xcode or even the windows developer experience with um you know visual studio and the entire modern ui and modern app stack absolutely absolutely i wonder if that's related at all because xcode is only on mac os and uh oh gosh what is windows or microsoft's ide called uh visual studio visual studio is only on or no, not anymore. Actually, it's on Mac OS now too, isn't it? Uh, well, Visual 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 Studio Code is available on Mac OS. I don't think Visual Studio proper is. Okay. Yeah, I don't think uh, so either. Then, so then they're both first party clients. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then you have Android Studio, which is on both operating systems and Linux, maybe. Yes. Too? Mm-hmm. Yep. So yep. then you have a lot greater thing to do. And I know Android Studio is written in Java because um, it's from IntelliJ which mm-hmm. is from JetBrains, and they do all that in Java. But yeah. I don't know if that's related or not. I'm sure that has something to do with it. Um, but also, even when you look at... Now, I don't know anything about iOS dev, but when you look at the... I remember trying to work with... Um, what was the, what was it? It must, it must have been Lollipop, right? That was the, mm-hmm. the first five branch after four. Right. So... When that was coming out, you know, they had all their new material design stuff and they had all this, um, you know, cool new UI stuff like the uh, fab button, the little button that floats around that you can do actions with. And, you know, their their color changing style bars and all sorts of cool stuff. Well, it turns out none of that stuff shipped with uh, Android Studio or with the initial API version um, of five. So if you wanted that, you had to build it yourself. Oh goodness! And so, uh, to me, that's really bad and it's really annoying. And so, it's not just the developer tools; it's also the development flow. It's just not as baked. Yeah, uh, definitely seems to be my experience as well. That said, I'm sure React Native is doing a lot behind the scenes to make that easier for me, and I appreciate it quite a bit. So, if you haven't checked out React Native, uh, it's a pretty neat framework, and it seems like it's only going to get more and more popular from here as more shops are doing it. Um, in in the real world and in production, um, and you know, there's there's some pretty surprising stuff I've seen um, that came out of it. Like Airbnb is using React Native in production. Mm-hmm. Um, I think TimeHop's been using it for several years. Or right. what was it? They rewrote it a couple of years ago. In some right, point. right, which is like remarkable because that means they bet on it like long before you'd think most people would, right? Or most most companies would, right? So do you think React Native is going to eclipse uh, WebReact, or they'll just be about the same? Ah, that's a good question. 
I feel like React Native has a little bit more novelty, right? Or it's, it's a little bit more of a novel solution to a particular problem, right? And that it helps like really quickly bootstrap cross-platform apps. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, that particular thing doesn't do a whole lot for you that like Cordova do doesn't, right? right? But, um, but to combine that with the React ecosystem, I think is really helpful and, and reactive um, and reactive interfaces, right? And reactive programming and um, all those benefits that, 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 that kind of generates um, all that, that, that kind of go down the line from there. Um, I feel like that's really where React Native is going to differentiate, right? Um, but I think, but your question was about whether React Web would be eclipsed by React Native. And yeah. I guess I'm not so, I'm not 100% sure about that because um, I know, like, for example, I've seen a lot more successful React Web projects than mm -hmm. I've seen React Native projects yeah. for whatever that's worth. And I feel like a lot of that's because React Native is still really finicky. Yep. Um, and until they can sort out that, and um, it's it's likely to remain kind of finicky. But um, that said, a lot of the things that I found to be finicky are things like um, permissions. So like on Android, I have to I have to specify in my Android manifest that I want to have access to fine grained location. Yep. And um, like that's all well and good, but there's a bunch of other kind of fiddly stuff that you have to do in the Android manifest and in the build, uh, you know, the Gradle uh, build scripts and stuff. Yep. Um, that kind of require you to have, you know, no pun intended, but almost like an Oracle, like, uh, yuck, yuck, uh, huh. like knowledge of, of that ecosystem in order for that to work. And I'm sure it's the same, the same thing goes for iOS. Um, and once you have that, it's pretty, probably pretty slick, but until then, like your the benefits are still kind of hard to see until you have a, a 1.0, right? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Because because you can you can get like a really a really alarmingly complete like O dot one, right? Like you can you can prototype really quickly. Right, and right. It can be one of the really neat things. But is it gonna be like a complete prototype? No, it's gonna be like, you know, it's it's like that old XKCD comic about how you're where it's like oh well iteration is making one complete thing every time right and then you just make a better thing or a thing with more features as, as you iterate right right um react native feels very much like the thing that that comic d it, it tends to discourage right yeah so um the thing where it's like oh cool i built the wheels this is awesome <laughs> you know right, but right wheels do not a full car make um that said like my experience with react native has been generally super positive and um, I'm working with a couple of other people on it who I like massively respect and think are really, really awesome folks. So as a result, a lot of these little kind of fiddly things have gone by the wayside real quick. Yeah, I'd like to um, really get into this React stuff. Hopefully yeah. I can convince people at work to do it with me. Because it's really, I think, the better approach. I mean, you don't, you don't hear anything about, um, you know, Angular 2 native. <laughs> okay not yet at least oh never so tell me about uh docker compose yes indeed so this is another tool i've used of late uh docker compose is pretty neat because it allows you to link together multiple docker containers uh in a way that um, otherwise would require a lot of command line scripting right uh, so i linked in here a docker compose file i used for a project recently that has a couple different components uh, a load balancer, a an API, and a um, Facebook Messenger bot, and uh, we'll we'll hear more about the Facebook Messenger stuff a little bit later. But essentially, what what you can do then is um, I can uh, create a a bunch of Docker containers that f each fulfill a particular purpose, link them together into a thing that um, provides like a cohesive interface. So in this case, the uh, first container, which is Nginx right here. Um, builds from the load balancer directory in, in a repository. Unfortunately, I can't um, open source that repository at the moment. But the load balancer really just serves to kind of, um, I, I mean, that's, that's kind of a goofy name for it. I, I named it that back when I was considering doing multiple API instances. Mm -hmm. um, but that hasn't really served to be the case. It's really just an Nginx instance that kind of acts as a reverse proxy in right. front of those two node apps. Um, so as a result, I just opened port 80 and 443 there. And then otherwise, I open um, port 8,000 and 9,000 
on those other Docker containers so that Nginx can hit those. Uh, and pretty much, you know, it's just links to Docker files from there and, and everything is awesome. Uh, hmm. So it's really great if you're, if you're trying to consider a way to use Docker um, to connect multiple containers together. So like if you have a database, uh, a database container and um, an API container and a front end container. So for example, if you're using an Ember app or a React app, this is, th this is what that's really like, um, really super awesome for. And then uh, to get this running, all you have to do is run Docker up and it'll, it'll fetch all the things you need and we'll build it all up and uh, golly gee, you'll have something running real quick. It's mm -hmm. becoming one of my favorite ways to deploy. Um, cool. So there you go. Yeah, I would, I would like to get more into Docker. I've used, I paused around Docker in May and got my weather bots up on there. And so that's been super nice to have. And I have a nice little script. So I just run update and redeploy and it'll pull from GitHub, update newer version of Python or whatever, and then stop and restart the bots. But I think, I mean, they, they're completely separate. So they don't need to be through Compose here. No, it's just a single service and script basically. But I think I'll definitely look at this during my next project that needs multiple services. Yeah, right on. The only thing I'll mention about that uh, is that I was kind of surprised you need to actually install a separate utility in order to make that work, but mm -hmm. it's pretty quick. It's just, I think it's Python based. So um, okay. it's just surprising because most of the rest of Docker is is all in Go as far as I understand. Um, like lib container I know is, is a Go or Go adjacent thing, but yeah. Uh, highly interested in, uh, in what comes of that. And if you have uh, any other things that you found with your experience, because I know I tend to drink the Docker Kool-Aid and uh, be like, let's let's Dockerize everything, Dockerize my life. Um, I definitely think I will deploy my next project that needs to be deployed via Docker on my VPS, so. <laughs> nice, right on, we're looking forward to hearing Heavily influenced that. by you, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, I got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no worries. So, so I guess the next thing is also me, isn't it? Um, Facebook Messenger coming. bots. You, you might have heard of this a little bit. So Facebook Messenger recently opened up an API so that people can create um, what one might refer to as bots. Uh, so things that you can chat to. And... That is beautiful. Did we lose Brandon? Sounds like it. Uh, oh, and it was... It was uh, it was it was pretty uh, a, pr a pretty neat little thing to do, uh, and I was really amazed with uh, as I was building it the kind of uh, the kind of interactions that you have with Facebook when when you do it. So it's all just webhooks like GitHub. Um, so it's really just like frightfully easy to to build one of these. Uh, the trick is to make a good one, kind of like React Native is 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 where that kind of interesting bit comes. Um, so I use Node.js for mine. Uh, there's a little bit about um, the rationale behind it uh, in a blog post that uh, one of the vice presidents at my company wrote. And they were had some interesting things to say about that uh, about that rationale and about why we built the messenger bot around it, which is pretty cool. Um, but it was really just an interesting way to like explore what uh, what building a messenger bot entails and uh, what building a really high quality one entails. And the answer is a lot of regular expressions. Huh. <laughs> well, you know what they say, yeah. once you have a regular expression to solve a problem, now you have two problems. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, yes, so it's the the result is that you, you get a lot of uh, you, you can get a lot of really cool things out of a Facebook Messenger bot, but yeah, you're right. Uh, it just becomes like it can become a regex soup if you're not uh, if you're not careful or a regex soup if you're a person who likes their acronyms to uh, to match with the way that the words that they acronymize uh, to match the pronunciation of the words themselves, which of which I am one. <laughs> mm -hmm. So is this is this app available on the internet? Like, can I can I use it? I think app. you invited me to a Facebook page. If I could understand correctly, if I yes. So you message that. the Facebook page. That's how it works. You message okay. the Facebook page. Believe it or not. Interesting. I shall investigate. Yeah, let me give it a go right now. Um, I need to go to a like one of my like pages. Can I see a list of previously liked pages? I, I like how um, on the side it says, typically replies within minutes. This is true. It replies in, uh, it's actually much better than that, like 15 seconds at most. Yeah. 
uh, and that was during maintenance downtime. <laughs> wow, Botswana, Ooh. huh? Wow, that's a good joke. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't, I can't take credit for that one. Somebody else came up with that one. Oh, it's pretty it's darn, so good. Pretty darn neat. So you only support flags for which there are emojis for, I'm assuming? What was that? So you'll only support the flag if there's an emoji for it. I guess there is an emoji for nearly every country, right? Yeah, yeah. So anything that there's an emoji for, uh, we support. Otherwise, it doesn't show up, and that's sad. But okay. There are a couple of weird situations uh, like uh, that I had to write in special cases for, right? Um, like mm -hmm. some people during testing wanted to find out the uh, the emoji for the the USSR. Of, of course, there's not uh, a USSR flag emoji because the Soviet Union was gone. Uh, pretty sure before I was born. Uh, so see, are you a time so, uh, traveler? It's been Russia since the nineties. That's good. But what about like? Do you have like Czechoslovakia too? Some of, or Yugoslavia? Uh, you know, I was considering. I was considering that, but I'm not hundred percent. Oh, it says there's a Yugo. Is Yugoslavia you know, I think I have a country? Regex for it, but I haven't. Uh, I haven't activated it yet. So I, I just clicked the message button, and I like the little like preamble it says hi ryan send me a country name and i'll find you the emoji flag for that country send me the emoji flag and i'll find the name for that flag and i think that's really cool yeah keeps it easy well and, and all of that works through some magical api that just works that's very impressive right yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a pretty big fan of the way that Facebook has it set up, and surprisingly, the app review experience is pretty painless too. For a while, I thought it would be a lot of back and forth, but they were pretty pretty quick about getting it uh, into the world, which is which is pretty neat. Uh, one of the things that I will note though is that they are expecting you to fulfill some keywords. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't I I personally don't feel like this is very well documented, but they're looking for you to um, fulfill some basic keywords like hello, hi, hey, um, thanks, uh, help stuff like that, um, which seems pretty reasonable. And uh, I face palmed when I, when I realized I didn't do that for the first version that I submitted to app review, but. Um, well, uh, when I sent hello to it, it sent me back a smiley face. So that's pretty nice of it. <laughs> nice. That's, that's one of the I've options. I've typed hi, help, hello, and it sends the exact same thing to me every time. But we'll see, maybe, does it respond to yo? Nope. No, it doesn't. Yo. It's not that hip. <laughs> Well, so I don't now, know about you. So now I need to incorporate with an insane amount of, of third party services to just parse language for common things. Or does Facebook provide yeah, something yeah. like that for common expressions used for a greeting? And you can just say greeting and then reply to this. Agreed. I, I feel like that would be really neat. Facebook does not currently offer that to my knowledge. Uh, and while I think that there's some stuff that IBM is doing right now with Bluemix that I would allow you to do that, I. Uh, I didn't really, uh, I wasn't really interested in spending the money to, to check that out. But I, I have tried those up before on a trial basis and they're really gosh darn neat. Yeah. Cool. So is this, this is officially sponsored by your workplace? So this is a project at, at your work? Or is this your own thing? Yes. Yeah, so, so this is a project that I had done. Um, it, it was an idea that came from somebody I work with. Uh, mm -hmm. And he and I kind of built it. Um, I, I did the engineering part of it and he kind of reviewed it because uh, he's our, our, our VP of uh, social engagement and uh, well, let me, let me look up his actual title because I wouldn't want to get it wrong because um, he's an awesome person. Actually, I bet he's probably been on my Twitter follows uh, recommendation at some point or he is quite, quite cool. Uh, PR and emerging media. He's the VP of PR and emerging media. Okay. Um, yeah, it's nice though because this is almost faster than searching through. Because on on a mobile device, you can't really search through your emoji keyboard for a country, unless you're using, I guess, Gboard or searching in a web browser. So sometimes this might be faster just to type in the country name, copy paste, and keep going. What was that? I think uh, I think you cut out for a second there. This is maybe a little easier sometimes because you can just. Put in the country, copy paste, and keep going rather than having to Google search or Gboard. I don't know. You go to one direct source to what get if, an emoji for a flag. What if you put two flags in at once? Yeah, that's kind of what we're thinking. 
What happens if you put two? Yeah. Is that what you asked? Uh huh. That's a good question. It picks one. Well, that's very good of it. <laughs> it picks one. Does it do the first one? I'm assuming. Uh, not always. No, it just picks one. Not always. Random. It picks one. No, it's not quite at random. Uh, it might look random, but it actually tends to pick the one that is uh, alphabetically oh uh, or lexicographically lesser. Uh, and the reason, the reason being, uh, the reason being, it's uh, I could definitely do a you know essentially match for every country as as much as I wish, right? Right. Um, but in this case, I'm not actually doing a regular expression. Uh, I'm a- I'm actually uh, doing some string. T- checking uh for every country because that's actually more reliable than most regexes i've seen yeah it makes there's sense some, there's some regexes that say oh yeah sure like like regex golf right that'll say um oh yeah i match every country um but it also matches some other stuff that um you run into surprisingly often uh, so I, haven't found, I didn't find a good enough regex that i wanted we needed to uh deploy it that uh, made sense that first so. So now the real question is, will you support Apple's rainbow flag once iOS 10 and Sierra come out, even though it's non-technically Unicode spec? Yeah, so that one's that one's not part of it um, because I'm I'm only focusing on country codes here. So I'm, yeah, um, because you know you're able to compose a Unicode uh, country code emoji um, by uh, by it's it's a flag emoji letters flag. Yeah, that okay. make up a, in a certain segment of it. Yeah, so that that's how I'm composing it there. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's a neat little project. Yeah, it was tons of fun to work on too. Um, it was really ever cool. open source. I'd love to check out that code. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Uh, I'll I'll double check and see on that. It was it was just uh, on our it's on our enterprise GitHub instance, which is uh, which is that kind of that kind of rationale for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's anything particularly like tricky. I think that in in a certain branch that's not um, that's in source control, but not pushed to any sort of source code hosting thing. I think I have a, a, a cert in there um, okay. because it has to it has to help out with the um, with the web server there. Um, otherwise, it's very difficult to get that into a Docker container right mm-hmm. uh, in order in order for that to be ser- served over ssl which facebook requires you have to um you have to kind of package that in unfortunately yeah yep well sure enough i think there's at least one other uh, one other topic here that i that i should talk through which is um that you guys remember uh friend friend of the show uh, max fuki uh of who course. mentioned at one point that he had a uh a Hackintosh or 80% of a Hackintosh built. Mm-hmm. Well, um, last weekend he and I ended up uh, building the rest of it. Well, he he had uh, purchased a drive and a power supply from Micro Center and he'd installed that and uh, he and I just kind of hung out and uh, and built the rest of that, which was surprisingly simple. Um, essentially, it was it was all um, it was all wizards, as it were, to to use the, the Windows XP word for it. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty amazing how simple that got. So did you use Unibeast? Uh, you bet we did. And then saw Clover? Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. Yep. And with that, you know, the only other thing was HDMI audio, which is pretty darn quick. Uh, and we supplanted the need for Wi-Fi um, by just wiring it in. <laughs> so yep. it's even. Well, yeah, I think Wi-Fi, I find it the best way for that is just to buy a card that is compatible. And yeah, I yeah. last, or what was it? Over the last fall, I think October, I some guy posted on Reddit on our Hackintosh and had this used Apple card from an iMac for a Hackintosh. Right, so it's the right. only way. That's the only way that I'm really, or it's the most reliable way to get handoff and continuity. So I, I bought it from him for fifty dollars or something. So then I got this nice wireless card. So I have handoff and continuity on my Hackintosh, and it's wonderful because it's an Apple right. actual Apple card. Indeed, that's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, I know. I think in our case, it's probably just going to be better off uh, wired in because it's close enough to an Ethernet port that it's in pretty darn good shape. But I think most that's all you need for most desktops. So yeah, pretty much. So is he using it as a uh, desktop then? Yeah, it's actually plugged into uh, to a TV, which is pretty neat. 
uh, it's a home theater PC of sorts. Oh, that's great. Nice. Cool. Yeah, I, I tried, um, you know, I built I built a computer while um, Brian was away, and I, I was attempting to do the Hackintosh approach. However, uh, for various reasons, it did not agree, and so I never got further with that. And that's probably just okay, because I'm never home anyway. I think we should uh, have a podcast Hackintosh party and get that installed on SSD for you. Yeah, we'll Indeed. see. I, um, I don't have an iPhone, so... Uh, most of those yes. iPhone specific features don't matter to me and you know it's okay indeed I mean I, I work in a virtual machine most of the time anyway I'm so I'm definitely with you there yeah and now it's time for what time is it <laughs> I think I think I'm pretty sure it's time for something new oh okay new Twitter followees ha <laughs> Well, let's see. As you guys might have imagined, I followed like 700 people between the last time we spoke. <laughs> how many follower, or how many people do you follow now? Uh, that's a good question. Let me open up my Twitter page. I actually have, have used Twitter remarkably little since uh, since I started working. Me too. Uh, employer over the summer. Yep. But I think if I load my... Yeah, right? If I uh, load my page, I'm now following 2,320 people. <laughs> okay. So I've definitely done at least 700 follows since we started this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've grown up to 265. <laughs> nice. So maybe like 65 in the last year. I don't gotcha. know. Right. Um, well, what do you say, Brian? You want to take the wheel first? Yeah, I guess I'm first on this list. So mm -hmm. uh, I followed Jack Lawrence. So I believe... Uh, this is a developer at Apple who works on Swift Playgrounds, uh, on I think the iPad version. I followed him during WWDC. I believe he tweeted some things about Playgrounds around that time. So that's why mm -hmm. I liked him. And looks like he's had some some nice things over the, over the last couple weeks. So I follow him. Um, next is Ole Zorn, and he is the developer of Pythonista, which is an iOS application. Yeah, he also does writing. editorial, right? Uh, yes. And um, I know him from Pythonista. So he, this is a Python writing app that you can do, um, I guess, automated workflows things, but with like pure code. So it seems like my, I haven't really used it too much since I bought it, bought it uh, two months ago, but I intend to someday once I nice. have... Uh, idea something to do but i did also see um i don't know how when it was maybe a year ago but um uh, steve uh uh shoot truffton smith uh, uh -huh. tweeted a bunch about eating Pyth pythonista to escape the ios sandbox inside the app and um like list directories at the root level of the device and things like that so if you know what you're doing you can get around some things. I think that for some reason you can you can import Objective C headers and things like that, so you can start using more system frameworks in ways that weren't intended. But because you're calling the code directly, you can go and use private APIs. If I'm believing, yeah, for sure. If I'm explaining correctly. So maybe I'll do Indeed. some of that someday too. I think Swift Playgrounds on iOS can also do something similar. And then finally, I finally followed Chris uh, uh, Velasek who is the half of the duo of hacking the Jeep Cherokee with Charlie Miller. So they presented at Black Hat last week, as we mentioned earlier. Indeed, indeed. Right on. A cool slate of people to follow, for sure. I just followed uh, Jack and Chris uh, right now. I, I've actually followed Oli for quite, quite some time now. I know he's... Uh, He's been big in the community of folks who use their iPads a lot, of which I kind of peripherally uh, keep an eye on. Uh, so for my three follows, uh, I, ha I took a while, but I curated it down to just three. Uh, the first is Patrick Thompson. Uh, he, he wrote a really interesting post on Haskell in production, uh, which is really interesting. He had a couple other cool uh, notes on functional programming um, in, in uh, kind of common and under a uh, common use and like under load testing and stuff um, that I found to be really valuable, um, hmm. especially as I've seen myself using more functional programming concepts 
uh, more frequently in the Ruby world and the JavaScript worlds, um, certainly with things like immutable state, stuff like that. And um, as a result, he's a really cool person to follow, I feel. Another one is Wild Bytes, which is a really, really, really cool interactive firm. Uh, I think they're based in Spain. And they do some really awesome stuff with uh, face tracking, computer vision, stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And they are just like such, such cool folks. Massive fan. Massive, massive fan. Uh, and they tweet about some quite cool things as well. So it's very, uh, very, very cool. Uh, very cool account to follow, I feel. Oh, VR as well. VR for sure. So they're on the, the cutting edge of everything graphics. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Um, that they're kind of interesting because they, they do a lot of work that's interest, uh, interesting to me as somebody who kind of wants to do that sort of thing. Um, that's the kind of programming that I think I really kind of enjoy. So um, lots of stuff with OpenGL shaders and stuff like that. So. Yeah, cool. And last but definitely not least is uh, Sam Ismail, who's the writer behind, uh, the showrunner rather, behind Mr. Robot. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. A little bit of a weird... Uh, uh, not not necessarily a super uh, a super common sort of uh, type type of follow for this segment, but um, he's actually a really really cool person. Uh, it turns out he used to work with a couple of people who I currently work with, which is pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're interested in Mr. Robot at all, for sure, definitely worth a follow. But he's also just like a really interesting person to follow on Twitter. So plus one uh, for that guy. Yeah, I, I recently watched Mr. Robot. Very good show. Indeed. Indeed. I have season two on Prime. I bought the entire season because I couldn't wait. Wait, season two came out already? Uh, they're releasing it episode by episode, but it, it comes on Prime the next day. So. Oh, well, hold on while I go and do that. So this is a show I've heard about. So, what's a elevator pitch for the show? Yeah, so, um, wow, it's, it's hard to do that from season two, but uh, in season <laughs> one, he is, uh, th there's a character who is played by uh, Rami Malek, who um, is uh, a programmer who kind of decides to be a vigilante of sorts. And the show is about him uh, being a vigilante, but kind of confronting his own demons, as it were. Um, and that's about all I can get into without um, spoiling it majorly. Uh, mm -hmm. So th there's, it's interesting because it deals with... Um, some like cryptographic things it deals with um some like really i mean perhaps definitely not like novel social ideas but social ideas that have definitely come out into the mainstream of of, of late um you know and, and it kind of um works with some social themes related to like occupy wall street and anonymous mm -hmm. yep. and um mm -hmm. like with with that sort of it, it does so in, I think, a really intelligent way that you don't always see. Well, you certainly don't see with stuff like, you know, uh, Law and Order or NCIS or whatever. So, yeah. You mean uh, CSI Cyber, right? Oh, right. CSI Cyber. There we go. Yes. I missed the easiest one to mock. Yes, yeah. yes. Right. Um, it, it failed all of its unit tests, in fact. Um, <laughs> Indeed. So I, uh, uh, I did suddenly remember I followed something, and it is uh, what uh, Brendan showed to us on <laughs> our Slack channel a few weeks ago, which was Flow, which is a static type checker for JavaScript, which I think is pretty fantastic. Um, Indeed. So instead of uh, picking up the standard JS um, tool, hey. I might pick up this tool instead because it doesn't drive me crazy. But, yeah, but right uh, but yeah, this is pretty cool. I, I like it a lot. Right on. Glad to hear it. Yeah, I have to. I have to try it out a little bit further. Yeah. Uh, entertainingly, I I learned about this at a point where we were trying to decide whether we were going to do it in an app, and we actually decided not to use it with a particular app mm -hmm. um, because there was so much rendered code that we had yeah. to include in such a way that, um, of course, it would never not even once pass it. But there are some ways around that too. Uh, yeah. It just was not was that's, not doable for the timeline we had. That's the hard part about that kind of stuff. Um. So I, I, like you said, I mean, my, my Twitter usage has plummeted from like a lot to like basically zero. Um, I don't really, I mean, I, I do check Twitter daily, but I don't, I don't write a lot and I don't see a lot. I don't, I don't know a lot. So if I, if no I worries. were, to, if I were to go to my analytics, I'm sure it would say you, you don't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's what, that's what mine told me too. You have. Your your tweet level is catastrophically low. Yeah, tweet more. Though, oh, right, you know, I feel like 
somehow well let me let me check on how much we've tweeted lately but i would i would still wouldn't be surprised if you tweet more than me i feel like i don't tweet that often i don't know except now <laughs> i have my my if this and that github bot thing yeah and that's tweeting that tweets at least half of my tweets in the last little while which may or may not be a good thing i think i push too often Yeah, Ryan. I still think you tweet more than me. Well, I'm I'm down five point one percent in the last twenty one days or twenty eight days. Let's see. It's not too much, really. But I'm down on thirty four percent in impressions, so oh, it's cool. it's it's okay. dropping. Yeah. According to my analytics page, let's see. I'm down forty three forty point three percent in tweets over the past 28 days. 17.7% yep. down in tweet impressions, 30% down in profile visits, and 51% decrease in mentions. Yeah, it, a little it, bit. it hit you harder than me, I think. <laughs> yeah, this is a little bit sad. And I, I work for an agency that does social media, among other things. You know, I... I uh, should be ashamed of myself. Like, um, you know, I love I loved tweeting and all, but... Um, you know, I, 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 I'm, you know, one of the reasons I use Twitter as much as I did is that uh, I didn't have anybody to talk to about all this programming stuff. And now that I do, because I work at a place where I program and talk to people who also program, it is less necessary, for, less necessary for me to tweet all the time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I am the complete opposite of you guys. Um, since I was at camp for a month, <laughs> I didn't do anything. This is just my Brian Mitchell account, so my tech one. Yep. Uh, I'm, tweets are up 212%, impressions are up 10.7%, profile visits up 72.2%, mentions up 146.2%, tolerance up three. However, tweets linking to me are down 50%. Well, it's because uh, Brandon and I aren't linking to you. <laughs> that might be true, yes. I should go to analytics more often. Right. Indeed. Analytics are a very uh, interesting thing where you can find out a lot about um, the way that you tweet, particularly, um, that I feel like I don't always, uh, I'm not, I don't usually have a good gauge for on my own. Do I know what my top tweet of June is? Sure. Yeah. It's one that you retweeted, Brandon, and that's exactly why it has so many impressions. It's 313 impressions. It's not saying me and Brandon Emmons to this neat MacBook won't run Mac OS Sierra. Been a good run though. I think whenever you retweet me, Brandon, it is instantly <laughs> my best tweet of the month. No, that's good to hear. I'll, I'll be sure to retweet you a little bit more often then. Only Mine if is, you find it necessary. You bet. You bet. Mine is uh, microwaving a metal container marked microwave safe against my better judgment. <laughs> <laughs> that Which, uh, um, I almost tweeted at you. That reminded me when I had an internship last summer. I so I didn't grow up with a microwave in my house, so uh -huh. I still find them strange and have to think about what I'm doing, but um, I put a half a Chipotle burrito in the microwave with an aluminum foil, and it was about eight seconds before I realized I probably shouldn't do that, so I took it out, but... Um, <laughs> you survived. I did survive, and I almost tweeted that story to you, but I didn't know how I would summarize it and enough for one tweet. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty dangerous. Gotcha. It's almost as dangerous as a pressure cooker. <laughs> yeah, goodness gracious. I'm but can you, put, can you put metal in a pressure cooker? You Probably could, but it wouldn't do a lot. <laughs> my other, my other top tweet, my top media tweet is that moment when you n walk up to a nice ride that's set at the exact correct height. Wow! <laughs> Simple things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I do adore those nice rides, though. Is that a bike sharing service? Yes, that's the um, that's the bike sharing ser service here in Minneapolis and St. Paul. I've never used one, but that's because I have a bike and I generally use my own bike. Yeah, see, I didn't, uh, I actually didn't have a bike downtown with me until yesterday. Yeah, because um, you would, you drive in from the suburbs, so it's, or I don't know where you're living now or where you yeah. live before now, but your two places ago wasn't close. <laughs> yep, indeed, indeed. But nowadays, yeah, it's uh, pretty neat because I can hop on a bike and I'm basically at work. <laughs> so that's what I want to do. Yeah. I'd like to not drive my normal commute. Yep. Yeah. It's been a long time coming, but it feels feels good to be able to just like be at work pretty darn quick. <laughs> yeah, I unfortunately have to drive all the way to Bloomington. 
Oh no. It's okay. I love. Is that what? How long of a drive is that normally? Uh, depends on the day, but it's usually about forty minutes. Yeah, and I guess it incentivizes you to stay really late because the traffic is way better. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> That's why I'm always there. I felt I felt that so much when I had to work at Eden Prairie. You're, you're farther north than me in St. Paul, but Eden right. Prairie is way farther away too. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. I stay late, but I also don't arrive particularly early. I think I get there at like nine, nine fifteen. So it's gotcha. okay. That's nice. some of the traffic has died down by then, yeah, right? Yeah, it's it's quite a bit less. Good. Right. Um. Well. well. <laughs> <laughs> Jake's. Uh, so I think we should ask the most important question. What is that? Well, I guess the question is, what are you doing next week? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, so next week, I'm going to be working on a couple of uh, interactive inst- installations, which is going to be pretty neat, uh, that are going in at a at a location, an undisclosed location. At a location. See. Yes, that that's, you might see in the near future. That's good to if know. You attend, if you attend sporting events. Wow. Um, I don't, I so maybe you. I won't see it, but... I know I, I don't either, um, <laughs> but um, that, that'll be pretty neat. Um, I really enjoy that work, so that's going to be cool stuff. Cool. Um, otherwise, uh, I'll probably be on Twitter a little bit more because I have, because um, apparently I have opinions. Um, <laughs> no way. But, yeah, right, right. Um, and I've also been uh, trying to get into photography a little bit better um, because there's lots of cool things to photograph around here. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be doing that. And if you check my Twitters where you can find me at Brandon underscore men, I will probably be tweeting about such things. And also the same thing on Instagram, Snapchat, not Facebook, pretty much everything else. Um, so you can follow me there too, if you wish. Fantastic. So me next week, I, I look, checked my calendar. I literally have nothing. So, um, (laughs) that is... That's something that I'm not doing, apparently. <laughs> Anything. Anything. <laughs> well, that's um, uh, that's good. Other than that, though, I'm uh, going to continue looking for work. But in the meantime, you can find me at JavaScript Minnesota on Wednesday, if this comes out in time. I don't know. Will it? Will it not? We'll find time out. Will tell. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Otherwise, you can find me on the internet at brianm.me. There I have a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7... 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 sites that I am on. Yeah, that is quite um, the impressive list. To summarize it, Twitter at underscore Brian Mitchell underscore is probably the best. And my new, uh, or my same GitHub page with a new username, I switched it from Beatman4789 to uh, Brian Mitch L. So B R I A N M I T C H L. I sincerely adore that GitHub name. Like, that's just a really awesome GitHub name. <laughs> Mad props to Emma Sachs, who thought of that when I was frantically texting all of my friends saying, what should my new GitHub username be? And they're all <laughs> like, what's GitHub? I, no, I, it was only computer science people. Oh, okay. So gotcha. I didn't have to explain too much. Well, you, But you, then I'm, I'm yeah. thinking also, do I change my, my, main, my non-tech Twitter to also be Brian Mitchell? But then you have the mix of uh, tech and non-tech and using the same username. So Well, obviously what you have to hope for is that Twitter dies and then you can start all over again. <laughs> exactly. There we go. Yeah. The Twitter apocalypse. Really? I mean, that's the only choice we all have. <laughs> well, you, you should uh, also mention where everybody can find you, uh, Brandon, because Brian did it already. Oh, yes, yes. You can find me on the internet just about everywhere, but particularly at my website, brandon.mn, where I write about things and occasionally post pictures I've taken. And uh, you can also find me on Twitter and pretty much everywhere else where I'm brandon underscore mn. Particularly, I've been kind of on on fleek, as the youth say, on (laughs) Snapchats, um, where I uh, have been sharing funny stories about weird signs that I found around town and... um, also biking and food lots of food pictures because food is delicious that's where all of our sponsors are from the food category pretty much (laughs) should i put i can i can sorry not to cut you off right i'll I'll also plug my my new uh youth media as well so i'm also on instagram at bman4789 i'm on vine at bman4789 where i post 
the latest memes that are uh, at least moderately appropriate. People still use stuff. Vine. I enjoy it. It's where it's where my most uh, uh, meme culture comes from. I would say that's amazing. I, I never see vines ever anywhere. I see them on Twitter a bit, not my tech one. Usually, well, actually, that's a lie. Uh, Steve Stroza just retweeted a vine on Twitter, but maybe they just don't appear to work in the on the whatever client I use. I don't know. I never see them. Hmm. I don't know. But then I'm also on Snapchat at bman four seven eight nine. So I don't use that. I uh, I always forget to use Snapchat. So snap me and then I'll snap you back. I, I met somebody from Snapchat a couple weeks ago. So as a result, now I have to always use Snapchat. because <laughs> You're sucked. See, otherwise I, otherwise I will let that particular person down. I generally avoid using Snapchat on my phone if it's under 50% battery because just by opening it causes such a, a power surge that usually my phone will die because yeah. the battery has been charged so many times. Oh, that's not a good sign. If if I use my camera and it's under 50%, I'm worried. <laughs> yeah, I need a new iPhone. I One do as well. Month. Are we all going to get the new iPhone this fall? We'll see. <laughs> that would be I awesome. I think that's a yes. I know. I know. I'm going to get it. And I'm going to get a Me new too. MacBook too. I'm going to get a new MacBook before I get a new iPhone. Oh, almost certainly. Same here. Almost Porque no less dos. Um, muchos dineros. Um, no tango. <laughs> Yo también. <laughs> um, well, uh, this week I'll be working like usual, and next week I'll be working also like usual. However, next week is a special week. It is my last full week on the current project that I'm working on. So I will oh, be wow. rolling off and then rolling on to a new project. Fun. Because Excited. we're going to be deploying. Any week now. Hey. Hopefully, hey. hopefully I, I get onto the um, post one zero, um, whatever project. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we'll we'll see about that. It's gonna be uh, pretty cool. Cool. Looking forward to hearing about that. Yeah. Nice. And of course, you can find me just about everywhere except Twitter because I don't tweet anymore. Um, so maybe I don't know. Maybe just Ryan dot said or Ryan Ramper said dot com. <laughs> I'm going to do it every time. I'm going to run it how many times I can't buy the domain. Yeah, I getcha. Mm-hmm. Right on, though. Well, this has been so much fun. Thanks so yeah. much, you guys. It was uh, good to uh, join up here again. Yeah, uh, got the back together. In another week or something, we'll do it again, right? Yes. Two. Yes, exactly. Not, you know, just about not seven or whatever this was. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, no, more, no, no more of that uh, delaying. Yes, at least in such extreme <laughs> lengths. Well, have a good one. Have a good one. See you guys.